Hello makers, this is Prof G. And if you find that a button that you've added to your microcontroller project isn't working, it may be because you need to slow things down. Now the button press may be generating lots of presses in the amount of time that your finger is on the button, and it may even end up in the same state that you started in. Now there are a couple of ways that we can fix this with a while pass technique called blocking and with a library that lets us use a technique called debouncing. We'll show you both. We'll do this on a Raspberry Pi Pico and Pico W, but the techniques that we learned should work on other boards as well. And along the way, we'll introduce the color wheel function, which will allow you to cycle through a rainbow of colors simply by passing in a number from 0 to 255. Let's code! Now, we could demonstrate this with a single LED bulb, but if you've been working through a CircuitPython school, you know that we love using our NeoPixel strip. This will also give us a chance to introduce the color wheel function. Here I'm using a Raspberry Pi Pico W. The wiring and code are exactly the same on the Pico, and you can just change the pin names and the code will work on any CircuitPython board using external wired up buttons. Now, if you're using the internal buttons on a Circuit Playground, see the earlier lesson using that board because the code is different for the Circuit Playground. So I'm gonna use pin GP15 as the button signal input pin, and I'm gonna use GP16 as the NeoPixel signal output pin. Now, before we demonstrate problems with buttons, I'm gonna introduce the wheel or color wheel function. Color wheel is actually a CircuitPython built-in, so even though we use an import statement, we don't have to add anything to our LIB folder. We just call from rainbow IO, import color wheel. And now color wheel takes an integer from zero to 255, and this graph shows how the color output works. The bottom axis is the number that you pass in, so pass in a zero and you get 255 red, but no blue or green. Pass in 85 and you get full on 255 green, but no red or blue. Pass in 128 and you get a mix of half blue and half green, but no red. Now this value here is where violet is in the rainbow spectrum, and then we loop back to red. So if you go from 0 to 255 and you restart at 0, it'll look like you've got a smooth transition throughout the entire rainbow, elegantly transitioning back to red. Now even though this chart shows RGB values, this function actually returns a single integer, but a new NeoPixel function that accepts the RGB tuple should be able to accept the integer return from color wheel. So for example, if I sent 128 to the color wheel, like this line here, I'd actually get back a single integer, which wouldn't mean much to you, it's number 32,000. 385, but the NeoPixel library will interpret that number as no red but half green and half blue, like this point right here, just as if I were to send it a tuple containing 0, 128, and 128. So now that we know how to use Color Wheel, let's write a quick demo to constantly loop through all 256 colors. So I'll hop over to Moo, and I'll call this code Pulse the Rainbow, and I have to import board, time, and NeoPixel. Also from Rainbow IO, import Color Wheel and we'll set up our light strip and call it strip. I'll create a constant for the pin location, calling it strip underscore pin and setting this equal to board.gp16. Then strip underscore num underscore of underscore lights equals 30. That's because there's 30 lights on our strip. Strip equals NeoPixel dot NeoPixel, capital N, capital P, and in parentheses, strip underscore pin, the location, comma, strip num of lights, the number of lights. Then we've got our infinite loop while true colon, and we'll loop through 0 to 255 with 4i in range, and in parentheses 256, and in a colon. Then we'll just say strip.fill, and the way that we get the RGB color that we want to use to fill in our strip is we're going to call color wheel in parentheses i. So color wheel returns a color that we can use inside a strip.fill. Then I'm just going to call time sleep for 1 one hundredth of a second, 0 0.01, and that's it. I'll open the serial console. I'll save code.py to my circuit.py volume. And look at that, we're cycling through the colors, restarting at red. This looks beautiful, mission accomplished. You now know how to use the color wheel function. So here's the challenge, and new CircuitPython programmers might struggle to get the answer for this, but that's okay, because this gives us a chance to show us the problem and two solutions we could use to overcome the problem. So first, see if you can solve the challenge. So start the device, all lights should be off. When you press the button, the wheel cycle should begin. It should start at zero, and it should continue until the button is pressed again. At that point, the cycle should stop and all the lights should turn off. Now pressing the button again should restart the cycle at the exact color where the cycle was stopped. And I'm going to wire up my button this way using pin GP15. So you can use this as your wiring diagram if you want to use the same code that I'm using. Now if you think your code looks like it should work, but it's not working, you might need to fix the button so that it reliably reports state true or false. And we'll show you how to do this with both blocking and the debouncer library. But first, give this a shot and see what you come up with. Pause. Try it out. Let's compare answers, but before I show you a working answer, I'm going to show you the common problem that will occur first. 
So back in Moo, I'll save this code to my CircuitPython folder, calling it color wheel. Then I'll close and reopen my code.py on my CircuitPy volume, and I'll change my comment to read pulse the rainbow with button start stop, and I need to import the digital IO library since I'm working with buttons, and we'll create our first button named button. We'll set that equal to digital IO dot digital in out, capital D, capital I, capital O. My button signal is wired to GP15, so I say board dot GP15. And then a line below, we'll say button, the object we just created, dot switch to input, and in between parentheses, we'll pass in pull equals digital IO, dot pull with a capital P dot in all caps up and as we learned in the prior lesson this will have our button dot value property report false if it's pressed and true if it's not pressed now I want to keep track of whether I am animating or not whether the wheel function is running and I'm using the value return to change the colors in my strip so what I'm gonna do is just before the while true loop I'm gonna create a boolean value called wheel underscore running and I'm gonna initially set this to false because I don't want the animation to run until I press the button now in my while true loop, if wheel underscore running colon, so that's if wheel running is true, it starts off as false, but when it's true, I wanna fill in the colors of my strip with strip.fill. And the way that I'm gonna get the current colors is I'm gonna call color wheel, and I wanna pass in, oh, I didn't create a value. So right underneath wheel underscore running, I'm gonna create a value called wheel underscore value and set that to zero. Then down in strip.fill, I'm gonna call color wheel, passing in wheel underscore value. And remember that function returns a valid color that we can use inside of strip.fill. Then I'm gonna sleep for one one hundredth of a second. And now we're not gonna use a for loop here. And that's because if we looped from zero to 255, we wouldn't be able to detect if the button was pressed inside that loop and save the number that's somewhere between zero and 255. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna add one to wheel value each time we perform strip.fill. And then when adding one goes above 255 we're going to reset the wheel value to zero and that's going to loop through all the numbers from zero to 255 but it'll give us a chance at each loop to check to see if the button was pressed and to turn off the animation at that exact color so first let's write code to increment the wheel value and then below this we'll write the code to check to see if the button was pressed so first I'm going to increment wheel value by one and so I can say wheel underscore value equals wheel value plus one now there's another way to write this so I'm going to comment this line out so I can show you the other way if I say wheel underscore value plus equals one that's the same thing as the line above it's just shorthand and you'll see lots of Python programmers use the shorter version of this now this will change my color one at a time, but one of the things that I wanna do is I wanna make sure that if I reach the color 255 and I increment by one, so I'm 256, that I reset wheel value down to zero. So in the next line, I'll say if wheel value is greater than 255 colon wheel value equals zero. Now below this, I'm gonna handle the button press. So I'm gonna check if button dot value equals equals false colon, remember that means the button has been pressed when we're false. Then underneath that, I'm gonna say if wheel underscore running colon. And so if I am running and I press the button, I wanna stop running. So I'm gonna set wheel underscore running equal to false. And if I just stopped animating, I set wheel underscore running to false, then I also wanna turn off all my lights and I do that with strip dot fill two parens zero comma zero comma zero close two parens. Then below this, in the else condition, else colon, that must mean that wheel underscore running was false. So I wanna switch that value to true. So below else, I'm gonna set wheel underscore running equal to true. And I don't need this old for loop, which was in the previous example, so I'm gonna delete that. And so new programmers, just to be clear why we wrote our code this way, using wheel running and incrementing the value here and resetting it back to zero looks much more awkward than the for loop. But what this does is it'll turn the color to our new value here, where we strip fill selecting the color using color wheel wheel value. But with each single color change here, we also check the button value to see if the button is pressed or not. So this lets us check the button press after each color versus a for loop, which had previously done a fixed loop through 256 values before going through the while true loop again. Now, despite coding things this way, you might think that this should work, but we're gonna notice some issues in the way that buttons are read. And if that ever presents a problem in your code, like it will here, we'll show you two ways to fix that. Let me show you what happens. Actually, before I go ahead and save, I'm also gonna turn off all of my lights before my while true loop. Remember, all the lights should be off because we don't start the animation until we first press the button. So just above while true, I'm gonna say strip.fill double paren zero comma zero comma zero close double parens. But in anticipation of this not working, I'm gonna put in some print statements so we can see the wackiness that is happening. So after button.value equals equals false, I'm gonna print in all caps button pressed. And then inside the if wheel running, I'm gonna print turned animation off. And in the else condition, I'm gonna print turned animation on. 
Now as I open the serial monitor, then save the work, then press the button, watch what happens. And apologies, as I record this, apparently Labcat Admiral Grace has performed a feline butt photobomb. When I'm pressing the button, it repeatedly reports being pressed as long as my finger's on the button. So my code is flickering between true and false really rapidly. And what I want is just to toggle false to true or true to false every time I have a single press. And you can see that I'm not reliably turning the animation on or off. Yikes, this is definitely not what I want. Well, how can I fix this? Well, the first technique that I'm gonna use is the blocking technique. And what that's gonna do is it's going to wait as soon as a button press is detected, and it's gonna hang there until my finger is lifted off of the button so I can ensure that I toggle just once either false to true or true to false. Let me show you how we do that. So with blocking, we're gonna write code that'll block any additional button value changes from occurring when the button is being held down. And here's how we do that. So right underneath if button.value equals equals false, we'll write while button.value equals equals false colon. Now what that's gonna do is it's gonna say, hey, while the button value is false, while your finger is still on this button, and underneath that, we're gonna put in a pass statement. This essentially says while the button is being held down, button.value is false, pass do nothing and continue to loop around until your fingers lifted off of this button and when that occurs button dot value is true so we're no longer in the loop now this is going to wait or block any further changes in the button until the button is released so we're going to hang inside of this little tiny while loop here so we won't get repeated true false readings since we're blocking any new readings until we release our finger from the button and the state changes from false which is what it is inside of this loop to true, which is where it will be once the finger is released. Let's try this out. Lab cats are lounging, no photobomb. I'll open the serial console, we'll save, and now watch what happens when I put my finger on the button. So I don't see any messages that show up, but now watch what happens when I release. All of a sudden the animation is happening. I see I got my button press, actually it should say button released, and I've turned my animation on. Now I'm gonna press the button again, and again, as long as I'm holding down the button, the blocking that I'm seeing up here is gonna continue to spin. But once I release, it should say button press, and we should see button running toggle to false, and the animation's cut off. And there we go, that's exactly what happened. Press again, I'm holding my button down, I'm inside of while button.value equals false, so I'm blocking, I'll release, turned on, press again, blocking, release, turned off, Press again, blocking, release, turned on, and we can see that the color change is, is stopping and starting at the same point too. So let's see if I press here, that's sort of a pinkish color, and then if I press it again, it starts at the pinkish color. How about if I do this, oh, maybe around, um, let's see, this greenish color, this yellow green, I'll stop, I'll turn it on again. We've got the yellowish green, blue now is where I pressed, let go. There we go, we got blue, it started again. So we can see this seems to be working well with blocking. So I'll close my serial monitor, double click my tab and save this to my CircuitPython school folder as breadboard button blocking. Then I'll close this tab, click load and load code.py for my CircuitPy volume so we can modify code on the board. Now the technique we're about to learn is called debouncing and that's typically considered to be the preferred technique. You should only really use blocking if you're sure you wanna block your code from executing during a button press. So let's cover debouncing. So a debounced button only reports one state change, a press or release at a time. Press and hold that button and just a single press is reported. Release the button, just a single release is reported. And we'll implement this using a library called Adafruit underscore debouncer. Now what's neat about the debouncing library is that unlike blocking, buttons created using the debouncing library won't hold up the rest of the code. We'll keep going through our while true loop and sometimes you wanna do that. You don't always want a button press to stop everything else that's happening on your board. So if, for example, you wanted a color change to start or stop when a button was pressed, even if we continue to hold down the button rather than when the button is released like we previously demonstrated, we can do that with buttons created in the debouncing library. And here's how. So we first import the button class using our Adafruit underscore debouncer library with this line here. And also you need to make sure that your LIB folder on your board has the library Adafruit underscore ticks. Now, if you follow the Pico setup lesson earlier in our playlist, you probably have that set up already. Otherwise, copy that file Adafruit underscore ticks over from the CircuitPython library bundle. Then we're gonna modify our button setup code just a bit by adding one more line. But first, I'm gonna change the name button in my first two lines that I had previously used to set up my button 
And now I'm going to call this button underscore input in these two lines. And I'm doing this because I want to preserve the name button in this third line and use it to create a debounced button. So here I say button equals capital B button. That's the name of the button class that we import from Adafruit debouncer up here. This is going to allow us to create a debounced button object, which we're calling lowercase b button. And what we pass in here is button underscore input, which is just the digital input object that we created in these two lines above. Now, just a note, if you previously followed CircuitPython school with the Circuit Playground Blue Fruit, we covered debouncing there, but the code was a bit different. The built-in buttons on the Circuit Playground use a pull-down resistor. But when we wire up external buttons, we use a pull up resistor. That's what you'll use every time you've got an externally wired button. That's what we're doing here. So all we need to do is pass the digital input object to create our button. Then, this is important, each time we want to check the state of our button, we call the update method on our button. So this is a method. It's a function attached to an object. That object is the button. We've got parens after this update. So you want to make sure that you have that, but we're not passing anything into the parens. And you usually call this update method before you check a button status. So you usually have that inside of your while true loop before you check to see if a button was pressed or released. And the way we can tell if a button is pressed or released is just to look at your button objects pressed property. If that's true, it's pressed. And we've also got another property down here, button.released. That's true if the button was released. Again, you're only going to get one press or one release that first time it happens, not if you hold your finger down, but we're not going to hold up our code like we did with blocking. So let's try this out. So I'll change my comment up here to add with debouncing to it. Then I'll import the class I need with from Adafruit underscore debouncer import capital B button. I'll modify this comment down here so it says create a debounced button. And as mentioned, I'm going to refer to button as my debounced button. So I'm going to change the name button in these two lines here. I'm going to refer to what used to be button as button underscore input on both of these lines. Then down below, I'm going to create the new object called button, and I'm going to set that equal to capital B button. And what I pass in between the parens is button underscore input. So what this does is it takes a digital input object and it creates a debounced button from it. And for us, that object is called lowercase button. Now down here in the while true loop, after our if wheel running block, we first need to update the status of the button. We need to do this every time just before we check to see the button state. So pretty much before you do an if button dot pressed or if button dot released, you want to have a button dot update. That's going to have open and close parens afterward. This gets the current state of the button. And don't worry if the state hasn't changed since the last time it was pressed it's not going to register more presses. Then down below, for a debounced button, we don't check its value property. We're going to check its pressed property. So we'll say if button.pressed, and we'll get rid of the equal equal false. So button.pressed is going to register as true in this statement if the button was pressed. And because I've implemented debouncing, I don't need any of this blocking code. So I'm going to get rid of the common and the while line in the pass, delete that, and I'll put a new comment above button.update that says debouncing. Then open serial and save, and let's try this out. Press and hold, and hey, this time the animation starts right away. I don't have to lift my finger off. If I tap again, it shuts the animation off. Tap again, on, off, even if I'm holding it's off. Tap and hold on. We see it starts right away, even though my finger's on. And you can tap away, but we can see we're not stopping the while true loop because the colors change as soon as we toggled wheel running on. This is looking fantastic, Circuit Pythonista. You've now got debounced buttons. Nice work. So this code is super useful. I'm going to close my serial monitor, double click on my code tab, and I'm going to save this to my Circuit Python library as debounced breadboard button. I'll close this and reopen code.py on my board. So I hope you found that useful. If you did, let me know. And if you're new to the channel, be sure to check out some of the other playlists for more big learning. Now go make something awesome.